Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with a man that needs no introduction, but we'll get a quick one anyway. The godfather of the tactical folder, Bob Terzuola. I had the honor of interviewing Bob five years ago before the show even had video and have always looked forward to having him back on. In those five years, Bob has greatly expanded his reach making access to his legendary designs more doable for the average knife junkie with production runs made by some of the world's top manufacturers and some other very exciting things that are happening now and in the offing. We'll find out about uh, what's going on and how it all started. Uh, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Download us to your favorite podcast app so you can listen on the go and, uh, if you want to help support the show, you know where to go. Go to Patreon. Quickest way to do that is thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, it is thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Bob, welcome back to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Hey, it's Bob. great to have you. Great to be here. Thank you. Two Bobs, no waiting. I know <laughs> two bobs, no way. Yeah. Uh, as I said before, two bobs talking knives. Like, what could be finer? Uh, I wanted to congratulate you on the Fox ATCF uh, uh, as we get rolling. I, I just saw that article and featured it on our last uh, Wednesday show. And I'm really excited because uh, that is a design that I've always admired greatly and uh, uh, maybe not the easiest thing to get my hands on. So, uh, now I have this opportunity, especially in a size range that I prefer. Uh, so congratulations. Thank you very much. I've got one here. Do you want to see it? I would love to see it. Okay. comes. They've got this really nice uh, pouch with Terzuola and Fox. And uh, this is, right now they're making a uh, titanium version, which is this one. Oh, and they're doing a beautiful job. Man alive. That is gorgeous. Oh, I got to say oh, this, this is uh, uh man blasted titanium. What, what kind of steel are they using? This here? is uh, Magna Cut. Oh, of course. How, they how actually, awesome. They're made in Italy and they actually got a whole shipment of Magna Cut delivered to italy so that's what uh that was one of my requirements that i really wanted a magna cut blade and they said okay they weren't happy about it but they said yeah. okay okay all right so for those who don't know this this knife this particular design is pretty much the one that started tactical folding knives i mean that's pretty much it that's if you if you uh, trace the family tree all the way back it's going to land on this knife it's a classic clean beautiful design um Thank you for bringing it to us in a way that we can uh, that we can mostly get. You know, uh, it is going to be affordable. Yeah, both in the uh, with the uh, thumb disc opener and it is also a flipper. So they've got a double action knife. Yeah, that's very cool. nicely made. So uh, tell us where this knife came from. I mean, uh, the 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 birth of it, the story of this knife. I was um, mainly making fixed blades back in the um, early 80s when I started. Uh, moved up from Guatemala in 84. And after a couple of years, I started um, looking into making uh, folding knives. And I got a lot of uh, help from Michael Walker, who lived up in Taos. I was living in Santa Fe at the time. And uh, Michael had been uh, developing the liner lock and I thought that was the way to go. Um, I didn't like the uh, lockback type or the slip joint type. Um, never trusted them very much. But the liner lock, I really liked a lot. So I made um, a couple of models. I made what I call the utility model, model number one. TTF is what I call them, Terzawola Titanium Folders. 
And uh, the second model was a mariner with a sheep's foot blade, um, very utilitarian. And I was making them uh, basically just um, as this knife you see here with uh, titanium handles, three pieces actually. They are, I'm having trouble with this left and right. There we go. Actually three pieces, two side pieces and the uh, spring plate in the middle. And uh, Michael Walker was using titanium. I like titanium, it's a very exotic material. And the first two knives, uh, the uh, model number one and the model number two, utilitarian and the uh, Mariner went very well at shows. People really liked them a lot. And I decided that I really wanted to make something that was, um, that could be used for defense as well as um, utility. And I started thinking about what later became um, known as the tactical folder. Tactical meaning, I mean, my definition is a tool for survival. And it could be survival uh, on the city streets. It could be survival out in the woods, um, in the jungle, uh, working, uh, packers, shippers. I wanted uh, a, 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 a knife that was big enough to be a good defensive tool, as well as um, utilitarian, just about any kind of um, project, and um, small enough to be able to be carried. I really like the uh, Spyderco clip concept that was developed by uh, Sal Glesser. And um, he very graciously let me uh, use his clips. In fact, um, I asked him, I said, Sal, can I can I buy some of your clips? I'd like to put them on, on uh, my folding knives. And uh, he didn't take any money for them. He just sent me a, a box full of them, <laughs> uh, some of which I still have, as a matter of fact. Oh, my God. But, yeah, I still have some. Um, they were the old uh, bent clips with uh, three screws. And uh, that was the original, uh, first-of-a-kind pocket knife uh, clip. And I liked them and they were okay, but I decided to change the design myself. So I made some other types of uh, bent clips and then machined clips. But that was the genesis basically of the ATCF. I wanted a, a knife that was good for defense and good for um, working, working people. As I said, uh, truckers, packers, uh, shippers, people who do a lot of uh, cardboard cutting and so forth. Um, so it was, uh, it was an interesting journey and I finally came up with the ATCF, which I called because of the materials, uh, titanium. And I was using a fairly advanced steel at the time, which was 154 CM, uh, back in the early eighties that was, um, uh, it wasn't really developed by Bob Loveless, but he was the first one to actually use it in, uh, knife blades. Yeah. So because of the titanium, because of the advanced steel, I decided to call it uh, the Advanced Technology Combat Folder, ATCF, and that's where that came. It was also called, right at the beginning, the TTF-3, because it was the third uh, folding knife model that I had made. Gotcha. But I like the ATCF better. I like advanced technology much better. I, I like uh, also your meaning of the word tactical because uh in this day and age uh in the knife community tactical is is almost synonymous with fighting fighting knife is this mm. a tactical knife is this for killing and uh you know that is one uh aspect of what you're talking about you're talking about tactical like taking care of any tactical situation that doesn't always mean combat it could mean whatever whatever situations in front of you you have to handle uh, exactly. Car, car breaks down. You're in the middle of the Pine Barrens. Uh, what am I going to do tonight? Um, you have that folder on you as a, uh, as well as I'm in this dark alley. And wh wh who are those people? You know, both of those things. So what about the liner lock? Was it that uh, convinced you over? I could see why you wouldn't go for a slip joint, but over, say, the back lock. Um, I'd, back locks, first of all, a lot more. Uh, complicated to make. 
I believe they're they're more difficult. They they take a lot of careful either filing or machining. Either one, you can you can make it both ways. Um, they're fairly reliable, but after a while, um, I always felt that that lug that fits into the slot, the, the lug that fits mm. into the slot of the blade up at the top that holds it could slip. Um, I'd, I'd seen it happen a couple of times with most really good makers. Um, it was, it was reliable, but some people, um, it, it didn't always, and sometimes it didn't always catch very well. Uh, the liner lock I saw, actually, the, the thing I liked about it was that it blocks the blade. Yeah. It doesn't hold the blade back like a top lock. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, a top lock, hold, it's holding the blade, you know, you yeah. like a horse. But the liner lock actually blocks the blade. It, it prevents it from moving. And if it's properly made, the lock won't slip off the blade. And if you put an incredible amount of pressure on the blade, you can deform the lock. It can actually bend, but it won't fail. It's still going to be there in the path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it won't fail catastrophically. That's what we call a, you know, a, a failure that would you know, would cut you or, or chop a finger or something like that would be a catastrophic failure right. rather than a slow slippage type of thing. Well, uh, okay. So um, one of your peers, I guess I would say in the business, uh, uh, Chris Reeve uh, came up with the frame lock or the integral lock as he called it reeve integral lock uh it's sort of based on the same concept but is also reinforced by your hand is that is that is that kind of the same i mean do you put those on the same shelf yeah they're, they're both they're, they're both liner locks in that a, a, a flat spring passes behind the blade slides onto a basically a wedge which we call the lock face and prevents the blade from closing by blocking the downward motion now chris um i remember i think it was I, you know i can't remember which show it was but it was at a guild show chris came over to me and asked me to step out into the hallway and he wanted to show me something and he showed me his very first frame lock uh, prototype that he had made just literally days before the the guild show this was in orlando florida i'm not i'm sorry i just don't remember the the, the year and i looked at it and i said chris i think you've really got something here it's it's uh it's a, it's a powerful knife in that the frame part the part that has the spring with the lock is much thicker than a liner lock Liner lock has a has a much thinner piece, which is quite sufficient to 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 hold it, especially if it's titanium. Mm -hmm. But he had the entire side with the spring made of much thicker material. And uh, when we make those now, we use uh, 100, 125 thousandths, about an eighth of an inch. Sometimes mm -hmm. I've seen people uh, make them even thicker than that. And it's a, it's a good, um, very strong, strong lock because it's exactly the same. It, it works on exactly the same principle as the liner lock. Well, where did the inspiration come for you originally to to make the folder in the first place? I mean, I know you said, uh, uh, you know, practicality and all that, but 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 for you personally, what were the circumstances that led to? Geez, maybe I need to start working on folders. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Um, at the time, mid 80s, 85, 86, I was making fixed blades. And fixed blades are pretty big and heavy. Yes. And I was taking maybe seven, 10 to a show. I was doing a lot of shows in those days. Um, probably um, five to six shows a year. And the fixed blades were heavy, took up a lot of space, and I really couldn't 
carry that many of them. And I said to myself, you know, there are more pockets than there are belts. Why don't I go in to start making folders? I oh, can yeah. carry more of them. It won't take as much space in the in the suitcase. And I can take my bathing suit along with me. So <laughs> I said, you know, let's do that. And um, then the the whole thing started to snowball. I got a hold of uh, Michael Walker. He said, yes, I'd be happy to show you how, how to do that. I studied his knives. I studied um, several other makers, Mel Pardue, uh, Ron Lake. I was pretty close to Ron Lake and, uh, and um, Joe Caius at the time. And they were making, uh, you know, really beautiful, I won't take it away from them, they were making absolutely gorgeous knives that I probably, probably would not have been able to make, and even today probably would not be able to make. Uh, the, the kind of um, um, detail and fine jewelry quality that they put into their knives was, was really not something that I aspired to. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't what I was looking for. Right. Um, I was looking for more utilitarian, more protection, um, lightweight, and a little bit bigger than most of those guys were making. Most of them were making oh, between two and a quarter, two and a half inch blades up to maybe up to maybe three, three and a quarter. So I, I wanted to make a, a, a bigger knife, but not so big that it wouldn't be um, comfortable to carry. So I... I stayed with the ATCF, which was about four inches. Four, four inches. Okay. So I, I had this romantic notion. Well, I shouldn't even put it that way. Let, let, let's let get to where you were, um, uh, you know, how this all happened. You moved down to Guatemala uh, when you were a young man after, after school, I understand. I remember you telling me. And uh, you joined the Peace Corps, which is an interesting um, uh, detail given, say, your fixed blade knives, which are which are beautiful and combative and all that. Tell us about how you, how you actually got started in the knife business and, um, and how you went forward from there. Well, I was working in, at, um, I, I did, um, I, I had several careers down in Central America. Um, I had been in Panama and uh, Puerto Rico as a Peace Corps trainer. And uh, I managed a, I became a manager of a jade jewelry factory in, Guatemala and Antigua, because I was carving jade also in my spare time. And um, our next door neighbor from the, the jade shop, his name was uh, Colonel uh, Jim Atwood. He, um, he got me involved in knives. He had written the definitive work on uh, the Third Reich knives. I think, he, I think the name of the book was The Edged Weapons of the Third Reich. Um, I've got a picture of his book in my book because it was quite influential. And uh, he got me started and I started making knives um, basically for fun because the machinery that I used for jade carving, some of the, some of the machinery I could use for grinding knives also. Mm. Um, and then I kind of got into, that was, that was for about a, a year, maybe I was making um, hunting knives, uh, field knives, nothing really uh, in the way of combat knives or stuff like that. And I met a bunch of people down there, uh, Marine security guards at the embassy, um, some, some commandos working with um, Argentine forces and so forth that had come up to El Salvador. There was a lot of turmoil going on in Central America at the time. And... Um, they were asking me to make knives for them and different kinds of knives. And uh, I developed the, uh, the uh, Model 30 Battle Guard and the Model 18 uh, Combat Master. Those two were the basic uh, military knives that I uh, first started out with. Do you, yeah. have any, do you have any of those to show, uh, just so we have an idea of what you're talking about? No. Uh, okay. Well, actually, not, just, not at the moment, not then, here. Then hold up Suze's fixed blade that you showed me before we started rolling so people have an idea of the kind of things you've Not for sale. <laughs> not for sale. Yes, this is not for sale. 
the uh, the Model 30 uh, Battle Guard was similar to this. This is the Battle Mate, which is uh, which has uh, metal bolsters. And the Battle Guard did not. It had protection at the finger, top and bottom, but it was incorporated into my car to handle. Mm -hmm. And it had a six-inch blade as opposed to a seven-inch blade, which is what this is. And um, it pretty much matte finish. And the first ones I designed at the request of um, a captain in the Special Forces. They wanted a uh, prize to be given to the uh, sergeant of the year, the non-com of the year, and the soldier of the year at Fort Bragg for the Special Forces. Cool. And that's where the first two Model 30 Battle Guards went. Uh, and I got some letters uh, back from uh, the sergeant and the uh, soldier thanking me for the uh, for the knife. That has got to be the coolest honor and the uh, uh, the greatest build to 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 make a uh, com not commemorative knife, but a you know graduation knife or that kind of thing for uh, the the brave men and women that that uh, you know defend us. To to have your knife be a um, uh, a prize or a, a symbol of your of your what what you earned is pretty cool. I, I just want to say before I've we actually continue. made um, quite a few knives for for military people, and if if you can if you can just uh, talk there for just thirty seconds, I'm going to get a special knife to show you. It just I didn't think of it. I've got it in a drawer right over here. Can you? Well, uh, this just is perfect. Thirty seconds. This is perfect because I I just want to tell viewers and listeners uh, who maybe they're new to knife collecting and looking into knives. Um, Bob Terzuola designed the uh, recent release, the 2022 release, or I'm sorry, 23 release, Civivi Tomashi, -e, and it's this beautiful sort of traditional. Uh, uh, Japanese Quaken blade on a Terzuola style handle. And he was talking before about the battle guard having integral sort of guards, uh, finger guards here that were incorporated into the micarta handle. And the same thing is happening here in, uh, in this knife. So if you're, <clears throat> if you're familiar with, uh, more familiar with more, uh, I don't know, uh, knives because you just got started in this hobby uh, and wonder where you heard that name. You've heard it here and you've heard it plenty of other places, but I'm always talking about this knife. It's so nice. Right. Anyway, sir. So I, I brought this knife back. I made this for a Marine Sergeant and it's a Model 30 Battle Guard. Whoa. Six inch blade, all my car to handle. And I was one of the people that developed the Kydex sheath. Okay. He was wearing this during a um, military exercise. I think it was Iraq, but I'm not really exactly sure. And there was um, a mine blew up near him. And a piece of shrapnel came flying at him and destroyed the sheath and took a chunk out of the knife. Whoa. Right there. Took a little chunk out of that micarta. Out of the micarta and uh, and the uh, sheath. Wow. Here we go. And he sent me a very nice little note. And there's his picture. Cool. And he sent me uh, the Marine Corps emblems there. He said, when the accident, in quotes, occurred, the knife was secured to my butt pack. So in a sense, you can say that this tool literally <laughs> saved my ass. <laughs> yes. I love it. it. God, how cool. And he sent yeah. it back to you. That's amazing, too. He sent it back, and I, I made him another one. And I said, I want to keep this one. He said, yeah. please do. He says, I no longer want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. What a so cool there's, story. There's one other thing I did with the uh, Model 30 Battle Guard. Um, 
I had a, I had a, this, this is, this is, I know you want to talk about folders, but this is, no, nah, talk about all of it. This was a, a model 30 that I used Whoa. as a table display. And it's a six inch blade, my car to handle. And the tip, I drove through a piece of stainless steel just to show how, yeah, tough. how, God, that's cool. and then, this is the table display that I had it on. I took the knife out to the range, <laughs> set up a shot, put it in a vise, and I shot it a um, whole bunch of times. I actually shot eight rounds at the blade and split the bullets. And you can see the halves of the bullets that we were able to recover. And uh, you probably can't see, but you might be able to see the scuff marks. Yeah, you sure can. Blade. Yes, you can. Just a little bit. Yep. So is, so that, was, um, is that ATS-34? What is that blade steel back then? This was, um, the, uh, this is 154 CM, oh, which is basically ATS-34. It's, it's the same steel. ATS-34 was made in Japan. CPM one fifty four was made in the United States. Okay, okay. Well, one fifty four CM, I should say, which became CPM one fifty four. Well, okay. So you're down there. You're you're down in South America. You have a you've you've begun your business uh, making knives. How did you integrate back into the states and 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 you know, there's a fledgling knife uh, world happening. I mean, there was a knife world happening at the time, not like it is today with so many different knives. And like, how did you get involved? Because I, I understand Bob Loveless was one of your sponsors to get into the knife making guild. It sounds like you you got involved in the in the heaviest way. How, how did you do that? Um, I just called him up and I said, I've got a knife on order with you and I've had it for several years. And I would like to join the guild. Would you examine my knives? And if you like them, would you sign me in? And he said, sure. So I flew up to Florida, actually, first to uh, Frank Senefanti, who um, later became a president of the guild. And he looked at my knives, signed off on them. And then I flew from Florida to California. And um, from there, I went to the first... Guild, my first guild show. I think it was 1980 or 81 in Kansas City. Hmm. And that started the journey, and that was it. Then I started, like I said, uh, a couple of years later, uh, moved up to the States in 84 from Guatemala, set up my uh, shop in uh, Santa Fe, and uh, then started making folders in about 86 or 87, somewhere around there. I was playing around with designs and so forth. Uh, the ATCF uh, came in in, uh, I'm pretty sure it was 87. And I introduced it at the Guild Show. Um, we were still in Kansas City, I believe. Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah, so the um, you're you're still making the ATCF uh, and and other knives by hand. I mean, custom knives. I, I want to talk a lot about the OEM stuff you're doing and the production stuff and how you are uh, reaching a lot of knife fans and and design fans. But before we get there, I, I want to talk about the fact that you are still making these by hand and like these exquisite pieces, oftentimes with. Uh, stag and and different exotic materials um still making the customs this is one that i finished today it's an atcf going to a friend dea agent, DEA agent actually um, nice. this is all handmade this was this is one of the ma made here in the shop and i've got another one that i finished today all two of them i finished today this one is an eagle rock Ooh. we call it a thin blue line and this is for a friend of mine who's a SWAT commander um, in the Southwest. And he wanted a thin blue line knife. I've made several of them um, commemorating uh, our police forces. Yeah. And this is the Eagle Rock with a double grind blade. 
just finished it today and I'll be shipping it off um, probably Friday. So yes, I am making um, knives still by hand um, the way I made them 40 years ago. So that Eagle Rock model is uh, in limited production uh, or small batch production with uh, Custom Knife Factory. Is that right? The Eagle Rock? Yes. Yeah. That, that it, it's, it's being made um, in um, Ukraine, I think it is. Where was that? I can't remember. Yeah, I think they're a Russian but, company. Yeah, it was an Eastern Eastern European country. And they did a beautiful job on it. It was a very, very well-made knife. They're working on a second model now, which is a smaller one. Oh, the same nice. Eagle Rock, but smaller. Um, they're calling it 2.0, I believe. That should be coming out fairly soon. Okay, so over the years, you've done a lot of um, um, collaborations uh, with the likes of, say, Spyderco uh, or Strider, Civivi, I think maybe microtech did you yeah um microtech so, did an atcf um bolster release oh god years ago it was, it <laughs> that sounds was, so cool uh that sounds really cool i i used to have one of their bolster uh releases uh that um that greg lightfoot designed that was a sweet knife too um uh, an atcf like that would just i'd never let that go uh, but anyway uh, what i want to ask you is how What's it like working with companies? Uh, uh, I know you have a you have relationships with some of the American companies, maybe some of the legacy companies that were coming up uh, adjacent to you. Uh, what's it like working with those companies to bring out your designs, which up until that point are customs that you pour over yourself, you put yourself into? What's that like? It depends on the company. Some of them have been um, very, very good, really wonderful to work with. Protec, for example. Protec uh, made and is still making this automatic ATCF. This happens to be, is this a tech? No, it's not. It's uh, all black. Um, and they're still making them. And they're. it's one of their most popular models. Uh, Dave Wattenberg, who runs Protec, is a wonderful, wonderful person to work with. Um, he keeps his word. He's followed through on um, everything he's promised, and uh, it's been a it's been a really wonderful relationship. Um, same thing with Spiderco. I had a lot of luck with uh, Spiderco and working with Sal Glesser. Um, worked with uh, Camillus um, and uh, several other companies that. Fox, for example, in Italy, we, we talked about the Fox knife, mm -hmm. the uh, the ATCF that they're producing. Um, they've made several of my knives. Um, MKM, which is another company in, in Italy. We really like working with the Italian companies, mainly because we love visiting Italy and eating the food. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. But we have, right. we have a great time. We, we, it's a good excuse to go over to Italy. Yeah, and write it all off. It's all business. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I've I've had there were there were one or two. How shall I put it? Uh, not so happy uh, relationships with some companies, which I won't name. No need to do that. Yeah. Not really bad, just not particularly um, helpful. We're just going to leave it like that. So your question. What's it like working with the companies? It depends on the company, depends on who's running it, and uh, depends on the people that are involved in it. And I would imagine the type of arrangement. You do something with Spyderco, you're, I, I don't know this for sure, uh, but you're probably licensing that design to them and then they produce it under their shingle and put your name on it. Um, but when you um, uh, have something made under your name you're just oeming it like the um i saw blade hq has some of your uh three inch atcfs or used to i should say um uh those are knives that you had oem for you for your company uh terzuola design uh that's got to be a different kind of relationship because you're not trying to get your design to fit into anyone else's model 
line. You're right. just trying to get these guys to make it with some level of fidelity. Right. And uh, it, it usually worked out very well. That particular knife that you're talking about, um, the, the three inch ATCF was very successful. Uh, we also had a three inch uh, Starfighter, smaller Starfighter, we call it the Micro Star, I think. That was a while back. Uh, and it worked out very well. Uh, and it's a, like you said, OEM, they make them and we sell them. Whereas with Civivi, for example, they make them, they sell them. We get a royalty on those knives that they sell with the OEM. They make them for us. We buy them from the company, whatever company may be making them. And our profit comes from selling them to the public directly. So as a knife maker, as a, as a businessman and a knife maker, um, what, what, what goes into the decision to do that? Um, my wife. And, <laughs> uh, let me let me put a finer point on my question because uh, as someone who hand builds these knives that are coveted worldwide by knife lovers such as myself uh you know you have high exacting standards um i'm sure you want to get your your designs out there into as many hands as possible but it's got to be hard to to sur surrender that control um well, we're, we're, we're very particular about quality control and about the way they look, the way they work, um, and the business practices of the people who, who manufacture and, and sell them. And I mentioned my wife. Now, Susan is really the business brains here. I'm not. Um, I'm the mechanical brain. Susan uh, has been doing a tremendous amount of work in promoting my work, in helping me with designs, um, in helping me with um, selection of materials. And she's been absolutely um, a major influence in our latest projects, which have been uh, filming and videos. And that's what we've been working on for the past, um, actually, since August, I guess. Well, we, let's, uh, let's talk about that at uh, Shop Talk with Bob is one of them and then a sharp life the video series what right. tell us about that there's two separate two separate but related things and both of them are me in front of a camera which is not my favorite place to be but um a sharp life is um basically a, 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 a an 11 part series of my book filming the manufacture by hand here in this shop of an ATCF from literally scratch, from drawing with a pencil the design to finishing the knife. And that's an 11-part series, and that's called A Sharp Life. The second so, project that we're working on... Oh, wait, wait, hang on, hang on, before you go on from that. So this, uh, if 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 people don't know, uh, you have a very, very famous book. As a matter of fact, the, the individual I, I interviewed two evenings ago, I asked him how he got into making folders, and he, he said your book, and that was it. That was basically his answer. Uh, so this is a, a video version of that book. Exactly. Um, in 11... 11 uh, episodes they're about a half hour 20 minutes 35 minutes a piece here's the book this is the one that we're that was that we uh, actually filmed here in the shop we had a professional film crew come in and we worked for two weeks um designing uh the entire program around the book in the 11 the 11 parts and we had a song written just for just just for this Shop 
Oh so we, man, that's great. Yeah, we had that written for uh, by Nathan Barlow. He's a fairly famous uh, songwriter, and he's Keith Urban's uh, keyboardist. Oh, nice. And a good name for writing a knife song, Barlow. I mean, come on. That's a yeah. little on the nose, right? It, yeah, I said that. <laughs> very, very true. So that's the Sharp Life. That's an 11-part series. Um, took two weeks to film. It was uh, quite an adventure, let me tell you, especially having a film crew uh, here in uh, my little old shop. Your sanctum. Uh, so you take them soup to nuts in this series, building an ATCF, basically. It's a soup to nuts. Yes, that's a very good way of putting it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So that's the um, the Sharp Life series. And then we have a subscription series, which we call Shop Talk with Bob. And that's composed of videos. We're going to have uh, two videos a month. And we call them Deep Dives. In a sharp life, I went through a whole series of procedures and tools and methods, uh, tapping and drilling, and but I, because it was as part of an entire construction of a knife, I wasn't able to dwell mm -hmm. on any specific technique or tool or procedure for any period of time. So the shop talk with Bob are oh, 25, 30 minute uh, videos. We're gonna have two a month. And what we call uh, deep dives into specific procedures. For example, we've already filmed the first two, one and two. And the first one was um, on uh, tapping, how to tap into titanium, how to do a blind tap, what taps are, uh, basically making screw threads mm -hmm. in a hole, which is what holds the knife together. And the second one uh, had to do with clips, making clips, uh, applying clips, designing clips, different kinds of clips, uh, pocket clips, and so forth. Uh, that was episode number two. And we'll be working on more uh, every couple of weeks. In addition to the videos, we'll be doing a weekly Zoom call, kind of like what we're doing now, except the subscribers, those people who are who actually pay to subscribe to be part of this, will be able to be on the Zoom call with us. We'll give them a password or a code or some technology of some sort. And um, they can ask questions. They can make critiques. They can uh, talk about their knives. They can talk about whatever they want that's related to knives and knife making in my shop. Um, we'll also have for the subscribers, there's going to be some swag involved, uh, packages of interesting little devices and things. We've got, for example, um, a book, a notebook. Mm. It's going to go for each of the subscribers and a, a pencil is going to go special mechanical pencil and some other nice little things. And we're going to have other surprises uh, along the way. We'll be doing um, uh, video calls or phone calls with other knife makers or collectors or uh, maybe even show promoters. You, you never can tell. People who are involved in the knife uh, knife community in one way or another. Well, this uh, so I mean, this is a huge opportunity. I'm sorry I'm interrupting you here, Bob, but I don't. this is a huge opportunity for knife makers because though you know you're a very affable guy and uh very easy to talk to you might not be uh you might not have the schedule to talk to every knife maker who might want to ask you advice but to be able to um uh, you know set, uh, ask you on a live zoom meeting when you were talking about carbonizing or when you were doing that thing there uh can you can you explain that again i wasn't getting it to like actually get it from you that's a pretty i mean that's a great resource well, we're hoping so. That was uh, that was Susan's idea. Uh, this whole thing basically was Susan's idea, and she's uh, produced it, and uh, she's ramrodding the whole thing and doing a, a really great job um, getting it out there. She she organized um, the film crew who who she knew in uh, New Mexico. She used to work in the movies in New Mexico uh, when the when the movies started going out there from Hollywood. Um, so we had a film crew here, and then uh, she got hold of uh, Nathan Barlow to get the uh, song done. 
Um, this is this is basically uh, Susan's project, and I'm just a uh, small talent, small part of the <laughs> your talent exactly. Talent. Well, I'm, I'm the on-screen talent, is what they say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. On-screen talent, and 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 being so, you get to be temperamental. You get to be moody. You get to hang out in your trailer and like not listen to the. Yeah, yeah, you you know it. Yeah, I don't so, do a good job. I wind up in the trailer. I'll be outside. <laughs> giving back is this something like, um, uh, you know, my father was a physician, and when he um when he retired, he, he did a lot of sort of Doctors Without Borders kind of stuff, um, and and even before he t retired, but for him, he was like, you know, this has this has been good to me, and I need to be, I need to pay it forward I, I don't like that expression but is that is that kind of something that is is where this is coming from yes um i studied to be a teacher in college i had a full scholarship to nyu for industrial arts education and right at the very end of my time there i decided i didn't want to be a teacher i didn't want to it's not that i don't want to be a teacher i just didn't want to spend 20 years doing the same thing Ironically, I actually have spent 40 years doing the same thing, but <laughs> been more pleasurable than standing up in front of a high school class. But as Susie likes to say, um, things have come full circle and now I'm teaching. And I've always really enjoyed teaching people basically anything. And sometimes I go off the deep end, like Susie says, you know, somebody asks you a question, you start in the middle ages and you start to you know, you work forward. Context. Yeah, the context. That's what I try to do. But um, I've taught a number of people how to make knives. We're going to have some testimonials from people. Um, a surprising number of women. Actually, we were looking back over this list of people that have actually come into my shop, uh, not only here, but in uh, Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and uh, made knives with me. People who had never made a knife before. Uh, people who had no idea how to even begin. Um, and actually walked out after, you know, three, four or five days with a knife in their hands. Um, and it was a surprising number of women who actually have, have, have made knives with me in the shop. And uh, in fact, we're going to have a very accomplished lady from England coming in uh, two weeks to spend uh, some time with us here. She's going to make a knife. She's uh, one of the more renowned saddlers in England, oh, she, she wow. hand makes English riding saddles. So she's a she's a, a, a super accomplished leather worker, um, and we're going we're going to very much enjoy having her here. We we've had this uh, relationship on Instagram. Um, never never met her, but we look forward to doing that. And she's going to stay here, and we're going to work in the shop. Uh, you mentioned uh, Santa Fe um, and Albuquerque, but Santa Fe in particular. And then uh, this just trip. And then you were talking about Michael Walker. I know he's still, I think he's in Taos or um, I, I follow him on Instagram and, and, and he makes knives. Um, you know, you, you got your liner lock from him. Um, but, but as you indicated earlier, he makes very, very different kinds of knives, very artistic, uh, jewel jewelry. Like when you were in Santa Fe, uh, I, I happen to know that that's a very, very artsy place. Was your, did that affect your knife making being in that artistic environment? No, okay. in a word, no, um, the art community in Santa Fe was very much removed from me and my shop. There were, there were very few people who were interested in what I was doing in knives in general um, and mechanical things. They were more interested in, uh, I won't say modern art, but um, art that... Um, contemporary. Contemporary. Thank you, Susan contemporary art. No, I wasn't really affected by or influenced by what they did or what the, either their work or themselves as people. Yeah. I enjoyed oh. going to some of the shows. 
the the uh, the openings and so forth at, at the there were like 165 art galleries in Santa Fe when I was living there. I don't know if there were that many there now, but um, it was uh, probably two or three openings a week, and they had free uh, wine and cheese. So you know. yeah, go get your your weekly hummus uh, fix. Yeah, it's like it's just like some some places some places at certain times are are just like creatively supercharged and and Santa Fe seems to be one of those kind of places and and it's always interesting. It really is. Yeah, yeah, it, it it was in those days uh that supercharge really didn't uh affect me very much. Um but it was there and you and you could feel it. There was a lot of uh, a lot of excitement about the art, the art world. Um, I got to know, in fact, I had you know, one of the very first uh, knife shows uh, I actually produced up in Santa Fe. It was a very small show, but we had fabulous people show up there. Michael Walker, Ron Lake, uh, Fred Carter, um, a whole bunch of people. Um, it, was, it was a nice little show. It was the only one we had. Um, but... Um, Santa Fe was was an, an interesting place. They say it's either the the geography or the gravity or something. You know, there's a lot of mystical quality that people put into some of the streams. It's all, it's all the limestone. Right? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of crystallography and woo woo stuff. You know, I used to say that there were three cons there are three conservatives in Santa Fe, and I wasn't sure about the other two. <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, Santa Fe really didn't affect me very much in terms of my work. I, I enjoyed being there. I enjoyed a lot of the people, but not as far as what I actually did. That sounds very much like uh, where we're coming from here in Northern Virginia. Uh, I want to ask you, OK, uh, people, as I did up front, um, refer to you. And I don't know if this annoys you or not, but the godfather of the tactical folder, really, you know, the, the, the guy that started this thing that uh, has evolved into a, a, a collecting and using uh, enthusiast group that is gigantic. And, and you are one of the absolute key players at the very start, uh, making locking folders like this in this in this uh, current sort of form. What do you see when you look out at the knife world today uh, with the trends and with the with how it's grown? What 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 are your feelings on it? Yeah, well, being called the godfather is better than being called the old man who still makes knives in his basement. Yeah. <laughs> um, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, I look out on I've seen tremendous changes over the years, tremendous changes uh, when I started. Everybody who was making knives was making them by hand, period. All the grinding was done by hand. All the uh, the cutting out was all done on a bandsaw by hand. Um, and then things started to gradually change. I was, I was actually the first knife maker to have parts cut out by laser. That's kind of a long story, but just suffice it to say that, yeah, in probably, I think it was 19, 1991, could have been 1990, I can't remember. I got tired of cutting all the parts out by bandsaw, especially titanium, which is pretty hard. Mm. That's not, it's not hard, it's just difficult. It's a difficult material to cut. And um, I got a line on people in Phoenix who actually had a laser, several lasers, and they were doing um, contract work. So I, 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 we didn't have any money at the time. It was a, this was a time we didn't have a, enough money to go to the movies on dollar night. But I scraped up some money. We went to Phoenix, I went to Phoenix, uh, brought some titanium with me, and I talked to people out there. And uh, they said, yes, we can do it. And I actually started having ATCF parts cut out by laser. And that doesn't mean that they were finished. They still had to be profile ground and polished and... The same thing with the blade parts. It was just, it was, it was fairly rough. The laser cutting has a, what they call dross. It kind of drips a little bit and so forth. And I ran into a lot of trouble at the guild because there were, there were people in the guild who believed that I was no longer making them by hand and I shouldn't be in the guild and they shouldn't be showing them. And 
but I had all the parts. I had the finished knives I would put on the table, but I also would have parts right off the laser, handle parts, a couple of blade parts. People were absolutely fascinated with them. This is, had never been done before. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. And they flocked over to pick the pieces up, to look at them, to handle them. They were absolutely amazed because at this time, very, very few people had ever even heard of a metal cutting laser. Mm -hmm. This was, you know, for, for the young people out here, out there, you know, watching this, there really was a time when uh, people didn't have cell phones, they didn't have computers, and nobody knew what a laser was. There really was a time. Um, but I started making knives, and I was able to make a lot of knives because I didn't have to spend hours at a bandsaw making titanium dust. So um, that was really an eye opener for a lot of people. And like I said, I was the first one and it was, it caused some difficulty with the guild because everybody else was doing things by hand. Since then, <laughs> since then, there aren't many people who are making knives completely by hand anymore. There's a lot of people, I won't say all, but there are many people, even people who are just starting out, who are making parts on CNC milling machines and CNC lathes. Um, they're not that expensive anymore because the, after the first, second, third, fourth generation uh, factories and, and uh, companies are sloughing off the older models and getting oh, newer cool. ones, and you can get, you know, in, in 10, 15 years ago, they were like twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000, which apparently is not a whole whole lot of money. And you can make a lot of knives on a CNC mill uh, pretty fast. And so many people are doing it that way. So they have turned their garages, I won't say basements so much, but they're mainly their garages or small uh, um, sheds outside. They've turned them into mini factories. Then they're, they're, they are factories. And if you look at Instagram today, you can see many knife makers will display piles and rows of the same knife, dozens of the same knife, exactly the same. Um, I've always felt that, that showing everything that you make all in one lump sum really wasn't such a great idea but some people some people do and it may be you know better than what i do um but nowadays so much has um moved into the, into the realm of high technology and um i think i'm one of the one of the last of the old dinosaurs you know one of the old dogs still doing it by hand i don't have anything automatic here um the most automatic thing I've got is my power feed on the mill that I still operate by hand. And that's about it, you know. Um, so in, to answer your question, things have swung from handmade now into high technology. Well, okay. So as we wrap here, um, like one must acknowledge that high technology levels the playing field and i'm not saying that a level playing field is always a good idea uh in terms of design you know because um, if you can just design something and then just have it built and then just put it out into the world um uh not that i know anyone who's doing it callously like that like everyone i know who are knife enthusiasts who have their own design and they're having them made uh it's it's there's a lot of six there are a lot of successful knives coming out of it but it's interesting to see it not come out of years of making knives by hand it's just a new um it's just a new way of looking a new paradigm as 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 you were saying what advice would you give aspiring knife makers new knife makers people who want uh you know they have designs that must be made what would you tell them my cad file my cad file please Learn the basics. 
start with the basic principles of working with your hands, with tools, learn how to file, learn how to tap by hand, learn how to use a hacksaw, learn how to solder if necessary. Um, don't, don't rely 100% on your CNC machine or technology or computers for design. Um, I uh, have never designed on a computer basically because I don't know how. It's not, it's not something that I was ever able to learn because I didn't want to. Um, and I never felt it was necessary. Instead, what I, what I had developed, and you, this is probably going to be backwards, but it's my analog CAD file. I don't know if that <laughs> can be read. Yeah, we my see it. analog CAD file. And this is basically pages and pages of designs that I made with um, cardboard, clear plastic, handles. Am I getting too much reflection? No, um, no, we can see that. It said okay. sheets of... This is over different... the year. This is like 40 years worth of you know, designs and stuff, and I've got, you know, more all over the place. Look at that. I've got handles, and I'm in the handles, and I'm into blades. i got some bunches of blade shapes there and all sorts of things. But basically, learn how to design. You, you, you said, you know, what, what would I advise yeah. people to do, young people? Learn how to design with a pencil and a piece of paper. You know, don't don't just rely on your computer. Um, I found that that a pencil and a piece of paper gives you a tremendous amount of freedom. You can sketch. You can you know throw lines out there. You don't have to use them. They don't have. To, you know, they don't have to be. Uh, you know, they, you don't have to be uh, so detailed that every little one is going to be you know a magnificent knife. You know, half of them you'll throw away. Doesn't matter. You know, just have fun doing it and get the basics learn what mechanical work with your hands is all about. I had um, some wonderful teachers, both in high school and in college, and they taught me assiduously how to do the basic hand operations with a file, with a hammer, with a hacksaw, whatever, whatever was available. And that has served me to this day here in the shop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to me, that equals self-reliance. What happens if you lose your ability to uh, run those computer programs? Yeah. You're still going to be able to make a knife. Mm -hmm. I like that. The, the basics. Bob, thank you so much for coming back on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure. And, uh, Man, I, we could talk a lot more. We we will. For those of you who are patrons, you can hear a little bit extra from this conversation. But thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Great being here. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. See everybody on Shop Talk with Bob or um, Sharp Life. I'm sorry? At Terzawola.net. Oh, at Terzawola.net. Uh, I just got my cue over there. See, I'm always forgetting things. <laughs> Right .net. that's where it's going to be take care bob and sue thank you so long bye, bye. visit the knife junkie at the knife junkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes videos photos and more there he goes ladies and gentlemen bob terzuola like i said before and i'm just going to say it again because it's fun two bobs talking knives uh can hardly think of a better wednesday night um, anyway, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you want to check out uh, uh, um, Shop Talk with Bob and A Sharp Life, uh, or just look at some of his beautiful knives, go to Uh, And then also you can check him out on Instagram. Uh, great, uh, great account to follow there. All right, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.